There is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name is worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proving himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like us. There is no rock. There is no God like our God. No other name is worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proving himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock. There is no God like us. Rock of There is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name is worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved, He's proven Himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like us. Rock of
they conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave So take me as you find me All my fears and failures
even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so come, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all will be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus returns, and he will return. But until that day, we need to worship him. We need to praise him. We need to praise the great I am, the king of kings, the alpha omega, the God who reigns in love, who rules in peace, the God who has set us free. So this next song, let's just really worship and glorify his name, because God deserves all of the worship. For he has always held the glory, and he always will forevermore. Lord, I will. 
will sing your praise. So words fall short, may they fall in honest worship. at your feet through everything you've done and everything to come I will praise you live the glory
That's a good song, but it's more than a song. It's a promise. I'm going to ask you guys to stay there. We're going to do that one more time. I'm going to ask you, especially you online, to really listen to the word. It's been a rough year. It's been a rough year. What do you look forward to? How do you handle it? What do you do? So many people ask that question. Half our church isn't even back yet, and we're not uncommon. People aren't returning back to church. People aren't worshiping. They don't know what to do. They're lost. This song, these words, this promise is what we have. This is not our home. All this stuff can go on. This is not our home. This is not what we're here for. We're here to worship. So let's do this song one more time. It's a perfect song leading into the, into the message today. But look, listen, understand the words. Embrace them. Live them. Sometimes it feels like I'm watching from the outside Sometimes it feels like I'm breathing But am I alive? I won't keep searching for answers that aren't here to find I know is I'm not home yet This is not where I belong Take this world and give me Jesus This is not where I belong So when the walls come falling down on you and me And when I'm lost in the current of a raging sea I have this blessed assurance 
assurance that's holding me. I just want to pray that we will keep worshiping you, God, because like I was saying earlier, there will be a day when you will return. So we just need to keep praising your precious and holy name, God, until that day comes. Amen. Thanks for working with me there. Well, good morning, Standing Stones. Good morning, everybody online, watching us online. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time someone told you, Jesus loves you? When's the last time someone told you that? Jesus loves you. No matter what kind of day you're having or how things are going, especially you online. I don't know what you're doing, where you're at. Stop doing whatever you're doing and just focus and understand. Possibly no one's ever told you the fact that Jesus loves you. You know, as we move along in our series, we're moving to 2 Timothy today. But before we get there, you know, pre-COVID, before this whole plague happened, uh, St. Peter's Square and the Vatican, they would have about 5 million visitors a year. But of those 5 million visitors, very few stopped at this house. People had to, had to walk up Capitol Hill to get to the Vatican. As you go up Capitol Hill, there is a building there. Can I see that first slide? There you go. What is this building? You walk right by it to get to the Vatican. You walk right by it to go to St. Peter's Square. But what is that building? Now, we know that this is not on many people's itinerary when they go to Rome. We know that because we know that the Vatican has 5 million visitors. This building does not. It has a fraction of that. Now, if you travel in the Middle East or if you travel overseas, you know that if there's a spiritual heritage site, they put a church on top of it. That's what's happened here. You see a little church there. But what's below? See, that's a prison cell. Actually, it's an it's a old cistern, an old watering hole that turned into a dungeon. There's only two cells in there, one the bottom, one on top. And this is where the Romans brought prisoners who had no hope. This is where Romans brought prisoners who were just waiting to be executed. This building is known as the Maritime Prison. And again, it's a dungeon. Now, the, the top level actually is even below street level now. But this is where the Apostle Paul spent his last days. This is where they placed Paul as they were about to execute him. And millions of people walked by this. 
to go to the Vatican, to go to St. Peter's Square, to be in Rome, but they walk right by this. Can I see the second picture? Here's the dungeon. This is where he would have been chained. This is where he would have wrote 2 Timothy from. This is where Paul would have been when he was all alone. He was sentenced to death. There was no hope here. Have you ever felt like you're all alone? Have you ever felt like you're isolated? If not now in this last year, when have we felt that way? Have you ever done the right thing, and by doing the right thing, it just blows up on you? You try to do what's right, and people get upset. People get mad. People get angry. Whatever it is, it just blows up, and all you did was do the right thing. Have you ever been to a place where you really need compassion? You really need someone to touch you with compassion, but yet all people have is criticism. Ever been there? That's what Paul is feeling inside this dungeon. He did the right thing. All he was was criticized, harassed, abused, and then put in this dungeon. Do you think people understand him? Do you think people know him? Do you think people know what he's been going through? That last song is what Paul would have been singing there. I'm not home yet, but I'm ready. People walk right by it. Don't even understand it's there. If you can answer that question, if you can answer that question, do you feel all alone? Do you feel like people don't understand you? When you need compassion, all you get is criticism. Then you understand what Scripture is talking about as Paul writes 2 Timothy. You know, we're transitioning from 1 Timothy to 2 Paul is now abandoned by himself in this prison cell. This is about five years. In 1 Timothy, it ended where he was on house arrest. He was in Rome. He was under house arrest. He had freedom. He had hope. That's why the book of Acts ends, by the way. And then Paul has, he, he's released from prison. He's released from jail. He goes out. He has three to five years of ministry left. And then he gets arrested again. And this time he's going to be put to death. And he's put not on house arrest, but in this dungeon. When we look at 2 Timothy... These are Paul's last words. Any parent or grandparent in here, if you had just one more opportunity to speak to your children, what would you say? I don't think you would say, well, how's the weather outside? Well, what are you planning for Thanksgiving or Christmas? You would have talked about important stuff. You would express how much you love them, how deeply they, 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 they mean to you. You would express all those things. If I had one more time with my kids, my last, would be, my last words to them would be, stay faithful. Stay faithful. No matter what comes your way, stay faithful. If I could end them with anything, that's the words of encouragement I would try to give. So, with that said, let's go to, to 2 Timothy. We'll begin uh, from here. Chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. I don't know about you, but that, that, that interests me. Because this is a personal letter. This is Paul. This is you know, father to son, spiritual son. This is mentor to mentee. This is brother to brother. This is pastor to pastor. It's a personal letter. And why does he say, Paul, an apostle of Christ? By the will of God, not by me doing it. I'm not standing up saying I'm an apostle. I'm not calling it myself. God has put me in this position. When someone calls himself an apostle, and Paul uses this in other letters, but the purpose of it is to validate his credentials. The purpose of it is to establish who he is. I don't need to sit down at the dining room table and look at my daughters and say, girls, I'm David. I am your father. I don't need to establish that credential. But yet Paul says to Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Why does he do that? Why does he establish this, this criteria? I, I think he knows that Paul, or that Timothy is going to take this letter and read it to the other churches. And I, I think he also knows that you and I are going to be reading this too. And I open that up because I want you to understand this is a personal letter from, from, from pastor to pastor to father to son. But what's said in here is for you and I as well. And Paul is establishing that with this. Even while he is chained in a dungeon, he says, I'm still a servant of God. Whatever I can do. Well, how can he serve God in there? He can write 2 Timothy, which you and I are still talking about 2,000 years later. It's God's word. Verse Verse 3. I thank God who I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience. I thank God who I serve. 
When's the last time you just thanked God? Especially in this situation. Realize what's being written from. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. I, I, I don't know how many times you do it, but I'll sit back and say, Lord, just thank you. Thank you for allowing this to happen. Thank you for, allow, thank you for loving me. That's why I said, Jesus loves you. When's the last time you heard that? Yeah, I know that. People, when's the last time someone looked at you and said, Jesus loves you? Because he does. And we need to love him back. The God I serve. And he says, Paul only prays twice. He only prays twice. He only prays in the nighttime, only prays in the daytime. That's the only time he prays. Daytime and nighttime, that's it. Day and night, I constantly remember you in my prayers, Timothy. See, this is, this is where circumstances should not affect or influence your time with God. Circumstances should not influence or affect. Look where Paul is at. But the kingdom is what should dictate how you spend time with God. How can you have faith? How can you have joy? How can you have a, an understanding of what's going on? How can you stand up here and sing a song that you're not home yet? Because the kingdom says that we can do that. There's a promise being made. So circumstances do not dictate our time with God. Well, I would spend more time with God, but you know, the kids have all stuff going on, and, and life is busy, and I'm just tired. Circumstances don't dictate our prayer time. Well, I would pray more if, you know, no. We do it because the kingdom says, do it. Spend time with him. God asks us to do that. Recalling your tears in verse 4, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Obviously, Timothy is very close and endearing to Paul. He, he trusts him. He loves him. But I think Paul says, I want to see you one more time because I want to encourage you. I want you to be encouraged one more time. Because I know what it's like to be a pastor. I know what it's like to be an Ephesus. I know what it's like to be a believer. I know what it's like to be faithful. I know what it's like to stand and, and to stand faithfully through your whole life. I know what you're going through, and I just want to encourage you. Keep going. When's the last time someone encouraged you? Keep going. Stay strong. Don't quit. Hang in there. When's the last time someone came alongside and just said, keep going? Keep going. Verse 5, I'm reminded of your faith, your sincere faith, that was first in your grandmother and then your mother. I know it's in you now. You know, he's saying that you, we, we can't borrow anyone else's faith. I have people say, oh, you're a pastor. Well, you know, my granddaddy was a pastor. You know, my family went to church. That's wonderful. That's great. Doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Doesn't mean that you have eternal life. Doesn't mean that you're going to heaven because granddaddy was a preacher. Now, other people can give examples of faith, but you can't borrow anybody else's faith. You, you have to have your own faith. You have to develop your own faith. Do your kids know who Jesus is? Do your grandkids know who Jesus is? Really know who he is. Not that we go to church or that we have to read the Bible, but know who he is. That's the privilege that parents and grandparents have. If you don't have any kids, there's kids in this, in this, in this church right here in this preschool right here that can be your spiritual kids and grandkids that you can pour yourself into and allow them to see what faith is all about. And to understand this picture, Timothy, Paul was preaching. When he went out on missionary journeys, he felt called to go out and just, just be a missionary. On his first journey, he went to a place called Derby and then Lystra. That's kind of like Phoenix and Peoria. They're close together. So he goes to Derby and he preaches. He goes to Lystra. When he's in Lystra, he's preaching, but then he gets rejected. They get upset with him. They get so mad at Paul, they take him outside the city gates, and they stone him to death. They think he's dead. They leave him in the dirt, just face down in the dirt after being stoned with rocks, thinking he's dead, and they leave him there. Obviously, he's not dead. He might be unconscious, he might be knocked out, but he gets up and he goes about his ministry. Now, how about you and I? If you go someplace, and you're sharing the gospel... And they get so angry at you that they, they beat you up. I hope they don't throw stones and hit you in the head with rocks, but they beat you up. Okay, and you leave that place and you go on to do ministry. And then it comes time to do a second missionary journey. And you look at the, you look at the schedule and you say, Lystra's on the schedule. Would you go back? Think about that. Look how, no matter if you had a, a terrible ministry experience, Someone yelled, screamed, offended you. W would you go back? Would you say, let's go to Derby and let's kind of make a little circle and go around Lystra? What would you do? 
I'm not sure I want to go back after I've been stoned once or twice. You know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of good with that. But if Paul had not gone back, he wouldn't have got Timothy. He would have lost Timothy. And look at the role Timothy plays in Paul's ministry and the plan that God had for Paul. The plan that God had for Paul included Timothy. Just think about that. If he didn't go back the second time, why did he go back? Because Paul said, you know what? Yeah, Lystra didn't work out really well. However, there were some people there who received. There were some people there who believed. We need to go back for them. At my own risk, at my own danger, I'll go back for them and, and preach the gospel again and help them mature and help them grow. And on the way, he ends up picking up Timothy. I'm reminded of your faith. Parents, we have a huge responsibility and privilege with our kids. Grandparents, we have a huge responsibility and privilege with our children to teach them that. Now, that's just the introduction. Now he gets into verse 6. He starts getting into the purpose of the letter. Uh, in, in 2 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 6, he says, For this reason, I remind you to stir up or to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. St to, to get the, the gift of God and stir it up. Fan that flame. What, what is he asking Timothy to do? He's saying, Timothy, you are gifted in these areas. Just keep growing in that. Keep doing that. Keep, don't, don't sit back and get lazy. Don't stop. Just keep growing. Keep preaching. Keep teaching. Keep leading the church. Keep pastoring the church. What gift do you have? Because this is a letter to all of us. Paul, an apostle, he puts his credentials there. He validates it. What has God built you to do? What has God created you to do? I ask that question a lot, and I get the looks I'm getting back now, kind of a stare. The eyes get big, and they look, and they go, I don't know. We, we do know. Now, a few weeks ago, I handed out spiritual gifts tests, and I asked you to take them. We had a lot going out, but only two have come back. Folks, you don't know your spiritual gifts by just taking that test. Here's the answer key. You kind of need the key to figure out what your gift is. Bring your test back. Let's go through it. Let's understand it. So we just see how God created you. If you have the gift of administration, you love doing that kind of stuff. If you don't, you hate that kind of stuff. If you want to teach, then you love teaching. If you don't, you shouldn't be near the children's ministry. However God's created you, however God's built you, he says, fan that flame. Stir it up. Keep growing. Keep going. Using your gifts. Because that's how the kingdom grows. That's what we're all about. You know, the, the Holy Spirit has given us, He's gifted us. Keep that fire alive, folks. And we don't do it for these four walls. We do it so we're a healthy church and we can reach people outside the walls. How many weeks until Easter? Anybody? Four. Four. Everybody said six. You're going to be late. Are you inviting people for Easter? We're going to have an outdoor service. We're going to have a barbecue. We're trying to do all kinds of stuff, but we're going to have fun. We're just going to have people. We're going to try to reach this. Dylan's voice is going to echo. Andrea's voice is going to echo throughout this community. Let's hope there's no rocks and stones out there. But anyhow, we're just going to, we're going to rock and roll and tell people about Jesus and let them know what's going on. Then we'll have a food. We'll have some fellowship time, which I expect you to meet new people. Look them in the eye and tell them Jesus loves you. You know, he is risen. He's alive. That's just four weeks away. You, you fan the flame. You, you stir up the gift that God has given you. How do you do this? Why do you do it? Verse 7. For the Spirit of God did not give us a spirit of fear, but what? Of power, love, and a sound mind or self-discipline. Well, in, in those kind of situations, I get panicky. I don't know what to do. He didn't give you that, that spirit of fear. Now, if you're being stretched and if you're doing something that's uncomfortable, that's a good thing. That's how you grow. But God says, do this. Stir it up. Keep going. Don't show up one week and be gone three and show up another week and be gone two and just kind of not be serving at all because life is too busy and the kids have activities and all this is going on. No, he says, stop. Stir up the gift. Use the gift. Go out there and glorify God. If you believe the words we sang before we came up here, this is not my home. This is not my home. I'm a citizen of heaven. Then that gets priority. And I do everything for the kingdom, not for the culture or the government or myself here. Amen? This is what Paul is writing to his, to his son. You know, now, Timothy, 
understand that he was, there was constant confrontation with false teachers. People didn't agree with him. In, in, in the time he lived, the culture in Ephesus was just like our culture now. It was perverted. It was upside down. It was, it was greed. It was lust. It was all those things. Nothing glorified God there. It was very secular and very pagan. What happened to those who said, I love Jesus? Next slide. Timothy was ministering in a day when Roman persecution was at, was at its highest. That's why Paul is in prison and won't get out. Nero is, they're, they're killing the Christians. There's some Christians here. There's wild beasts. Look at the, the stands. The Romans are excited. At the, you know, they're excited about what's happening to them. This is a game. And people are being put to death by wild beasts. Now, here's the question. What did those people do who were there with the wild beasts who are about to attack them? What did those people do? They stood for Jesus. They proclaimed Jesus Christ as Lord. All they had to do was renounce their faith. They could have renounced their faith and saved themselves, but they knew this was not their home, that their home was in heaven. And you may kill the body, but you can never kill me. And they stood strong. This is persecution. This is the reality that Timothy is trying to minister in. Now, I don't know about you. I don't think you will be thrown into the wild beast. But church, we have some tough times coming. Our nation just went through a tough time, a year being closed. We missed Easter last year. How do you have the church closed for Easter? Churches across the world was closed for Easter last year. But, but when you look at what, what's coming, yeah. anybody ever hear the Bristol Four? Two Americans, two from the United Kingdom. They were street preachers. They got thrown in jail. The judge put them in jail and, and, and sentenced them for preaching. Preaching for preaching. Two Americans. Uh, what about hate speech? What is hate speech? Do you know now the government has passed the Equality Act? So, so now if we say certain things, it's, it's going to get to the point. It's not in the church yet, but it's coming that way. Church, are you ready? Are you ready for persecution? A and what are you going to do when you have to stand against that? Do you renounce your faith? Do you accept the paganism? Do you accept the culture? Or do you say, no, folks, I, I need to stand for this. The reason I need to stand for this is because of you. Why does Paul go back to Lystra where he was stoned and left for dead? Because of other people. They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the truth. They need to understand Christ. They need to grow in their faith. So we're going to stand firm, face persecution for other people because they need to hear it. It's not about you and I. Amen? Does that bring any excitement to you at all? Does that bring fear to you? God did not give you the spirit of fear, but of what? Power, love, and self-discipline or a sound mind. This is why we do what we do. Verse 8, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Join with me in the suffering for the gospel. Why would any believer be afraid? Why would any of a believer be ashamed of the gospel? When you hear the name of Jesus, uh, we've gone into a, a store once or twice. Actually, I think it even happened in an elevator one time when my family's there with my kids and a Christian song comes on. And they go, Daddy, listen. They're playing a Christian song. We're shocked. We're happy. You know, but it's a Christian song. We, we, we recognize it. Why would anybody be ashamed of Jesus? Anybody who calls themselves a believer, anybody who knows how much Jesus loves them, why would they be ashamed of the gospel? See, Jesus was hung on a cross. In this day, in this culture, if you're Jewish, you look at Deuteronomy 21, 22. If you look at Deuteronomy 21, 22, the, the Jewish form of capital punishment, if you're guilty of a crime and you should be put to death, the Jewish form of that is to stone people. Take them outside the city gates, throw rocks, throw rocks, and kill them with stones. That's the Jewish way of putting people to death. But Jesus was not stoned to death. He was, he was hung on a tree, hung on a cross. Why? Why did the Jewish leadership work with the Romans to, to find Jesus? That trial with Pilate and what happened up in, 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 in the upper room. What, what took place there? What happened there? Why was Jesus crucified? Because they knew in the Bible that the Jews would look at Deuteronomy 21, 22. It says, anybody who is hung on a tree, i.e. a cross, is cursed by God. And you must remove his body before nightfall comes because he's cursed by God. Well, this Jesus Christ who's out there preaching and teaching and healing and doing all the miracles, well, all we got to do is prove that he's cursed by God. 
If he's cursed by God, his ministry ends and the Pharisees gain popularity back again. But if we stone him to death, he becomes a martyr. His ministry gets bigger. His disciples get bigger. So we're going to knock that off. We're going to make sure that the word of God, that God himself says, this man is cursed. That's the Jewish side. The Romans, anybody who's crucified, that is the most degradable, that is the most disrespectful way of killing somebody. So the Romans would say, this is your Messiah? This is who you worship? He's the bottom of the barrel. The Jews would say, well, he must be cursed by God. But what nobody was expecting was Sunday morning. He is risen. He's alive. And that's what we celebrate in a few weeks. So the curse is not there. Him being degraded is not there. But this is why people would be ashamed. How do you look at somebody who is cursed by God and say, that's my Savior. That's my Messiah. That's who I worship. Or how do you look at somebody who's despicable and, 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 and degraded and say, that's my Lord. So people were ashamed. He says, don't be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Understand he's alive. He's more alive now than ever before. And folks, we've been given 2,000 years of warning for the days that are about to come. I really hope and understand, and I hope that you understand where the church is right now and what's coming against us. And we've been told in Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, in the last days, it's going to be this way. The church just needs to be ready for it. If you're stirring up your spiritual gift, if you're flam fanning that flame, if you're excited about Jesus, then you will be ready. If you're sitting back just saying, well, church is nice. I like that song. It was comfortable. Then you're going to be shocked. And you're going to be forced to say, okay, in persecution coming, where do you stand? It, it, it depends how you see it. Verse 9. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done. Amen to that. Not because of what I've done or you have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed or abolished death and has brought life and immorality to, to light through the gospel. What is, what is the purpose of life? That, that's, I'm not trying to be silly with that, but what's the purpose of life? Is it just to be happy? Is it just to be comfortable? Is it just to be lazy? What, what, what's, why, why are we here? Why do we do what we do? Folks, understand. Please understand. If you are a believer in Christ, if you know who Jesus Christ is and have accepted him, then you have been redeemed. You have been redeemed. It, it's, it's vital. It's vital to acknowledge and remember what you have been redeemed from. What have you been redeemed from? Where would you end up if you weren't redeemed? What would happen to us if Christ didn't die on the cross? What would happen if he didn't raise from the dead? What would happen if we couldn't sing, heaven is my home, not here? Understand what you've been redeemed from. And it has nothing to do with what you've done or I've done or how good we are or how great we look or how well we respect people or anything else. It's all about Christ and his blood. To answer that first question, what is the purpose of life? We have to understand that we are here to serve in the fellowship of Jesus and to help others do the same. That's our calling. That's our purpose. And it says, you know, folks, I, I don't know about you, this kind of blows my mind, but it says that this was God's design before you were even born. Before you were even born, this was God's design. If you, if you look, I won't go there for time, but if you look at Ezekiel 33, in the time of Ezekiel, it's just evilness going on. And God says his desire, his heart, is that even the wicked turn and repent and come back. God's plan, his design, before the beginning of time was that we would worship him, serve him, fellowship with him, and have eternal life. Understand what we are redeemed from. And death has been destroyed, has been abolished. How many people are afraid of death? I, I freak my family out with this one. I think you've probably heard this story before online. You may not have heard this, but I want to preach my own, my own funeral. I, I, you know, I just, I want to be able to preach my own funeral because I want to make sure the gospel message is out there. 
it'd be kind of fun too to say, I'm looking down on you. Yeah, you know. But I want people to know the truth that death has been abolished, that, that, Beth, that death has been, been, been destroyed, that it's been conquered because of Jesus. Is that what you believe? Well, I believe, no, I, it's not what I believe. It's what 2 Timothy first, verse 10 says. Christ Jesus has destroyed, abolished death, and he has brought life to light. Once we receive this, and we know we, we un, it's not deserved, his grace we don't deserve. We just can't comprehend it sometimes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 says, The saying that is, that was written, will come true. Well, what saying and when was it come true? This is the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Well, Paul writes that in 1 Corinthians. Where is it in the Old Testament? Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death forever. Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O oh, death, are your plagues? Oh, grave, is your where is your destruction? When you realize this, when you really realize this, that death has been defeated and Jesus Christ is Lord, then you live differently. If you're not living differently, then you're not understanding it. And this is a quiet time between you and God. You just kind of get in the corner and say, God, do I really understand that death has no power over me? That the physical death may happen, the body may die, but we never cease from existence. And when you understand what the promise is, then you just live differently. The gospel, this gospel, which I was appointed an apostle and a teacher, Paul says, this is why I'm suffering. All Paul had to do is renounce his faith. And he would have been fine. But he says, no, this, this is why I'm suffering. At verse 11 and 12, yet this is no cause for shame. Okay, I'm in jail, I'm in prison. There's no cause for shame. I'm here because of my, my, my love for God because I know what words next, who or whom I believe. It's not just what I believe, but I know who I believe in. We, we'll get a Wednesday Bible study and we'll do apologetics. And what do you believe about this? And we'll ask tough questions and we'll figure it out and we'll, deep it, we'll go deep. But the real thing is who, who? Not what. Who do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe he did what, he, what the Bible says he did? Do you believe what happened? Do you believe the future? Then he can get in all the other kinds of stuff. But he says, I know who, not just what. The penalty for preaching and teaching Christ in that day with Nero in charge was death. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of that, and I'm going to do that. If it cost me everything, then it cost me everything. And Paul explains the suffering he went through. Folks, this is amazing. Here is a man who didn't grow up to understand who Jesus is. You know, on the road to Damascus, that changes. And even then, he's got to go to Saudi Arabia and really understand theology. And then he starts to preach. He goes to Lystra. He gets, he gets stoned to death. He goes to Corinth. And there's a fortune teller there. Fortune teller is by demonic means. He casts the demon out of a, of a girl. Business people are, who are making money with that, so they get upset. He gets thrown into prison and wants to be beaten in, in Corinth. He goes from Corinth to Ephesus. In Ephesus, 25,000 people riot against him. He goes from there to Thessalonica. He is literally run out of town after three weeks by preaching the gospel in Thessalonica. He gets down to Athens, and in the, in the philosophers, the Greek philosophers, mock him. And he gets to Jerusalem, and they want to kill him. The Roman soldiers actually have to pull him out of a mob to save his life. That's the life that he's living. If that is your ministry, when do you say, I quit? When do you say, enough? Man, if I'm going to be stoned, and, and mobs are going to come after me, and people are going to accuse me, they're going to throw me in jail. Okay, God, I'm done with you. No. Paul says, I know who I serve. And they can do anything they want against me. They can come against me any way they want. They can do whatever they want because I know who I love and the promise and the future I have. It's all by his grace. I don't deserve any of it. Folks, that's somebody who understands the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I hope, I hope as you're hearing this, you're really hearing it. That's why I asked the worship team, do that song a second time. Understand where this is not our home. Paul can stand there and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I believe. It, it, that begins in the past, but it continues on. Faith begins at one point, but it continues on. 
Last verses, 13 and 14. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit. It's only a deposit which was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Timothy was taught the Old Testament by his grandma and his mom. Uh, Paul also was well-versed in the Old Testament. Since a boy, he understood the Old Testament. They, they understood what was prophesied in the Old Testament about the Messiah. They understood the words of Jesus when Jesus came and, and ministered here for a few years. They, uh, they understood that the, the prophecy of the Messiah coming, they understood that Jesus' words fulfilled those prophecies. They understood all that. He said, I'm going to guard that. That is valuable to me. A few weeks ago, I asked you, what's the most valuable thing that you have besides a brand new command? What's the most valuable thing that you have? You're probably going to say your children or your grandchildren. What about your relationship with Christ? What about who Jesus is? I'm not saying your grandkids and your kids aren't valuable. They are. I would give my life for mine as you would for you, yours. But what, where's Jesus in all of this? See, that's how we live our lives. That's what we do. That's how we, we grow in this. Especially those online. I, I know a lot of people in the room today. I don't know who's watching online. But I started out by saying Jesus loves you. That's just not a slogan. It's not a saying. It's true. And there's a deep promise there. I, I pray that you understand what that really means. And, and time is short. There's a, there has to be an urgency there. For those in the room, there has to be an urgency here. Because things are going to change. Things are going to be turned upside down. Do you think things have been upside down the last year? Just wait. What was passed yesterday with, our, with lawmakers, what's coming down the pipe? Be prepared. Be ready to be the church. Because you're going to need to stand with your faith for Christ. But you have everything you need. I have everything we need to do that. We have the Holy Spirit. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Power and love and a sound mind. Father, we thank you. I thank you that we can gather here and just lift your name up. I thank you that we can understand you. But above all, Lord, thank you for your grace and the promise of eternal life. Lord, I pray for everybody watching online right now, that if they do not know who you are, they think they're a good person, you, you can never be good enough. Let them be a broken person. Let them be a humble person. But most of all, let them be a person who comes to you and admits they need you. Let them recognize you as Savior. and Let them understand the deep need for serving you. For those in this room, Lord, and those who may hear me later, I pray you understand, what is your life all about? What are you spending your time doing? Is it having a party? Is it having a good time? Is it being happy? Is it being comfortable? Is it being lazy? What do you gain from any of that? Are there times you can be happy and be lazy and be comfortable? Of course, but that can't be the focus. Lord, I pray that everybody in this room can just make a new commitment today and say, today, it hit me. I understand it. But this is not my home. When we go on vacation, Lord, we don't do landscaping and we don't paint rooms and we don't do things. That's not our home. We only do things when we come to what belongs to us and our home is in heaven. And may our resources, our life, our time, everything we have be focused on the kingdom. May the time that we have, may not circumstances not control it or direct it, may it all be controlled and directed by the kingdom, by you. Jesus, may we stand, may we lift our arms, may we lift our hearts, may we sing songs to you and tell you how much we love you and understand that your grace is amazing and your love is forever. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. the sun I 